I'm um, Erik Persson. I'm Associate Professor in Philosophy at Lund University and a researcher at RICE Research Institutes of Sweden, where I'm working on um, space philosophy, among other things. And uh, <clears throat> I was asked to uh, talk about the challenge of defining life, uh, which is a pretty big challenge and I think an important challenge, not least in astrobiology. Um, a, a definition of astrobiology that you see now and then, um, including some, some NASA documents, is this one. Astrobiology is an interdisciplinary field concerned with the origins, evolution, distribution, and future of life in the universe. So there's a pretty strong focus on life. We talk about origins, evolution, distribution of and, and future of life. Okay, so life is very important here, but what does that mean? Um, <clears throat> what, 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 what is it that we are looking for? What is, is it that, what, that um, we are trying to understand and why? And the why question is, I think, pretty important when it comes to the definition, and I will get back to that. So life is important, not just in astrobiology, it's important in, in many academic um, fields and disciplines, in the natural sciences, in the social sciences, in medicine, of course, in uh, engineering and law and humanities, but also outside of academia, in, in literature, art, film, and in general life. Um, so life seems to be a very, very important concept for, for most people. Um, and I guess, especially for astrobiology. And, and I think even more important for astrobiology than for biology. Uh, which seems maybe surprising considering that biology is like per name, the science of life. But I think there are two reasons for this. And uh, basically, biology has come to study primarily known entities, um, you know, plants, bacteria, uh, mammals, and so on. While astrobiology is looking for life, looking for the origin of life, and so on. So astrobiology seems to be more about the uh, life as such, and also the, the boundaries of life, like its origin and, and distribution and, and so on. Um, so for astrobiology, it's important to, to have some kind of definition of life in order just to know how and where to look. Uh, what kind of instruments to use, what kind of tests to use, and where to look. We need to have some kind of idea uh, of what we're looking for. But also, how do we know if we found what we're looking for? That green blob, maybe, and we find on Enceladus or somewhere, is that life or not? We need some kind of success criteria. And again, that means that we need to have a pretty good understanding of what life is. Okay, so what is life? Well, I have some good news and some bad news. The good news is that there are many suggestions for what life is. The bad news is that there are many suggestions for what life is. And unfortunately, there is no real consensus. Okay, so what should we do about that? Well, first of all, I think we should start by making clear what it is we want from a definition of life. What do we want to get out of it? I guess we want to be able to recognize life, when we find it, we also need to uh, be able to 
use it to increase our or enhance our thinking about life. And I think these the following criteria are maybe useful. First of all, this is probably obvious. It needs to include everything we agree we agree is alive. If we come up with a definition of life, and it turns out that according to that definition, human beings are not alive, then I think we can say that that definition has failed. But it also needs to exclude everything we agree is not alive and not alive. So if we come up with a definition of life that tells us that the desk that I'm sitting in front of here is alive, then I think also that's a good reason to discard that suggestion. Right, do we want something else? Yeah, um, we want it to be fairly stable. If it has to change every time we do something, every time we find something new in biology or even find a new species, then maybe it wasn't such a good definition to start with. But it also, I think it's also important that it helps us solve the tricky cases, right? So we need it to, to give us the right answers to things we already know are alive and things that we already know is not alive. But there are also cases where we don't know really. I mean, even on Earth today, like viruses, it's a, it's a matter of discussion of viruses alive or not. And a definition that cannot help us with these tricky cases is not much use, especially in astrobiology, where we supposedly will uh, find and study life as we don't know it on Earth today. So this green blob on Enceladus that is not really like anything in particular we know from Earth, um, uh, on Earth today, is it alive or not? If it cannot be used, to, to, to answer that question, then maybe it's not a good definition. Um, it needs to fit kind of with established biological theories. Um, by that, I mean that if it turns out that, well, someone suggests a definition of life that denies the existence of evolution, for instance, then we can say that no, that's not a good definition of life. Uh, on the other hand, it, it shouldn't be so rigid that it excludes any progress in bio. Right? I also have one more criterion. It needs to account for our fascination about life. It may not be uh, obvious to everyone that this is important, but I think it is important. And I think considering what we said before about life being uh, so important to like all of us, um, if the definition of life cannot explain that or at least account for it, then I think it's not a good definition. Uh, if we have a definition of life that is so makes life completely uninteresting, then why should we spend all this effort looking for life and studying it and trying to understand it? Um, we may dis want to discuss this afterwards, but I think this is an important criterion for definition of life. All right. So um, let's look at some attempts to define life. First of all, a common way of defining things is to use what's called a lexical definition. A lexical definition just means that this is this is define a term uh, or concept in terms of how it's usually how this word is usually used. So if you want to know what I don't know a word you you read but you you haven't heard it before you've forgotten what it means you can go to an encyclopedia and look it up. And then you know, aha, now we know what life is. But I don't think that's a very good uh, answer to our quest to define life. As I said before, 
we don't have a consensus of what life is. If we had, then okay, we, it could it, it could work to go to a, a encyclopedia and look it up, but we don't, right? So we need to need to figure it out. Um, trying to do that by going to an encyclopedia would be a bit like um, you know finding out what dark energy is by going to the encyclopedia and look it up. We don't have the answer, so it's not in the encyclopedia, right? Um, so we need to we need something else. The most common way of defining things, uh, the, the most what, what's like the typical way for philosophers to go about defining things is called the Tere definition or the real definition. It goes back at least to to Socrates. Uh, in one of his his dialogues, he even. Um, scolds one of his interlocutors because um, he, he asks for definition and the the answer is he gets is not a Dere definition and therefore it's not a real definition according to Socrates. So this is this is like how definition should be according to the traditional way of defining things. Right. What is that? Well typically the Derrida definition is looking for the essence of whatever it is. So by providing a Derrida definition of life, you should be able to, to identify like the, the essence of life. And it's usually set up as a, as a set of, a sufficient set of necessary criteria. So if you have it could be one criterion, but it could also be any number of criterion. Uh, and if you have um, a list of criterion and each one of them, C1, C2, and so on, is necessary, uh, and together they make up a sufficient set of, 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 of properties. So if you have all of these properties, then you're alive. Good. Let's look for but definition according to, to, to this, this setup. Uh, and there are several, uh, quite a lot, in fact, of, of suggestions about criteria to be included in a list like this. Um, you probably know several uh, already. Uh, the ability to, to, to procreate, to reproduce, obviously, that's very strongly associated with life. But we also know that there are exceptions. Not all life procreates. Um, first of all, no life procreates all the time. Um, so, but but there are also living organisms that never procreate um, for different reasons. Maybe they don't survive long enough. Maybe they are sterile and so on. Uh, the mule is a standard example of something that is clearly alive but doesn't procreate because it's it's um, sterile. So this cannot be a necessary criteria for 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 life, um, even though it's it's very strongly associated with life. Other criteria is, for instance, that it has to be organic, and that that's interesting. Um, you could say that it's a pretty good criterion in that all life we know on Earth today is organic. But on the other hand, we don't know about life on some other world. Um, could it have some other uh, chemical composition? Um, it seems a little bit arbitrary to demand that it's organic. If we find something on another world that procreates that comes up to us and, and introduce itself and say, hi, wouldn't it be weird to say, um, I don't know if you're alive. Let's let's check your chemical composition first. So it seems a little bit arbitrary. Uh, evolution is something that is very strongly associated with life. So uh, if it evolves, is it alive? Well, there are some issues with this. And the most serious one is that evolution, yeah, uh, that's very, very strongly associated with life. But what 
is actually evolving. It's not us, organisms, it's the population. The population evolves. The individuals live and die and may or may not um, procreate in between, and therefore may or may not uh, affect the next generation of the of the population, but it's the population that evolves. So does that mean that humanity is alive, but you and I are not? So I would say, yeah, that's how it works. Um, others, including me, will say that that's a bit odd, saying that we as individuals are not alive. So maybe even evolution that is so strongly associated with life cannot really be used, um, at least not obviously as, as a definition, uh, as a criterion, uh, as being part of a definition of life. Metab metabolism has been uh, mentioned. Um, the problem with metabolism is that that's not clearly defined in itself, um, which makes it a bit difficult. It's a bit difficult, for instance, to distinguish between um, to find a definition of metabolism that that is applicable to life, but not on, say, a car that is using um, petrol or, or or electricity and and spare parts from the outside world and and produces uh, heat and, and and movement and and um, uh, pollution in the other end. Um, so there are some some issues with the definition of metabolism that makes it maybe not obvious as a part of a definition of life. The genetic material is, is, is mentioned. Uh, some, some would focus on the, the chemistry of genetic material, others on the function of the genetic material as something that, that um, transfers um, properties from one generation to, to, to the other. Uh, to the next. Uh, others say that why is the material or the the yes the, the, the function of, of transferring information what's most important? Why isn't it the information that's the, mo the most important? Um, and for instance, people who want to create uh, a life, artificial life, this life in the computer. Uh, that my computer program is alive. Um, it has the right information and and uh, um, um, the, the the information works according to the rules of biology and so on. Um, what I'll just say that it's a bit odd to say that a computer program can be can be alive. Um, interaction with the environment. Um, important, but seems that um, interaction with in the environment is also not clearly defined in a way that, that can be um, where we can distinguish between life that interacts with the environment and, for instance, um, thermostats that, that um, um, or a robot or something that interacts with the environment. Um, yeah, self-regulating, same thing. Um, a thermostat is self-regulating, and how do we distinguish between that and something that's alive? Uh, entropy, uh, that's a pretty popular criteria for life, something that can temporarily withstand entropy. So the um, thing is that living entities can um, withstand the... the uh, um, a typical um, tendency in the world of going from from organization to chaos, and um, by creating more chaos in the in, in the in, in the environment, it's pretty good. Uh, many uh, physicists think this is this is an interesting way to go. Um, many biologists think that it seems to. Like, uh, uh, reduce biology to philosophy to 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 physics in a way they don't like. Uh, so all of these are are controversial in one way or another. So what can we do about this? Is there is there any like killer um, idea that can that can solve this? Well, 
it's an ongoing discussion. We haven't seen any any solution yet that everyone accepts. Uh, so why is it so darn difficult? Well, my answer to this is that it has to do with, with the assumption that life has an essence. A Dure definition assumes uh, that there is some kind of essence of life, something that never changes, something that is always the case, some property that all life has, no matter what happens in the world, which is hard to, to reconcile with evolution. Right? Life is a moving target. Life is in constant change. Um, is it really realistic to think that there is one particular property that all life has that will never change and that will exist in all life everywhere. I don't know. Maybe there are other way, ways of going about defining life. So let's look at some, some suggestions. Um, the list definition, um, well, that's that's probably... Uh, one of the least realistic ones was a list definition. Well, it basically means that you list everything that's alive. It could work as a definition, but it's, of course, um, pretty um, useless when we talk about life. If we have something that has uh, a concept that has very few instantiations, you could maybe list all of them. Uh, but life, uh, if you list everything that's alive, uh, first of all, it's a hopeless endeavor because we have so much life. And second, life changes all the time. So we would have to update the, the definition every second or so. So no. The ostensive definition means like the pointing definition, which is a good pedagogical tool. And that's probably how kids learn about things. Maybe how all of us learned about life from the beginning as a parent if if you kid if you want to teach the kid what a chair is you point at different chairs and, and, and eventually the kid will will get an intuitive grasp of what a chair is and probably that is how most of us get a this intuitive grasp of what life is. We have seen a lot of different kinds of life and start to get a kind of understanding, okay, this is how life works. And that's great, but it cannot, again, help us with the tricky cases uh, because it's totally based on our previous experiences of life. Uh, the prototype definition uh, is used in biology, um, has been used. Um, for instance, there are prototype um, prototypes of species. Um, at my university, for instance, Lund University has the world's largest uh, collection of uh, biological prototypes, which means that if you find something, I don't know, a, a piece of moss, and you want to know, is this really this particular kind of moss? You can go to the depository and compare it with the, the prototype of this moss and see, why oh, is it sufficiently similar? Uh, okay, so it's, it's probably this species of moss. Um, as you understand, this is not a fail-safe way of, of, of doing things. And again, it only works for known species. Um, right, the stipulative definition is pretty useful. What it means is that we don't bother about finding the definition of life in this case. We say that, okay, we just decide ad hoc how we want to define life for this or that particular purpose which can be great in many cases, but for life, I think probably not. Um, because life, as we saw before, is so important for all of us. And all of us have some kind of 
intuitive understanding of what life is, at least on Earth today. And for astrobiology, life is, as we also saw before, like the key concept. So it's too important. If, if someone um, say that, well, I define life as um, something that is between two and three millimeters and uh, contains a particular molecule, uh, and then they find it and say, hooray, I found life. Okay. Good for you, but no one else will be impressed, right? Life is, is um, there are too many people who, who has a very clear view of what life is for this to work. A slightly more sophisticated version is the operational definition, which means that you start with some method or tool um, that you have, and then you say that, okay, I define life in such a way that it fits with my method. So I want to send a um, lander to Mars and fit it with this particular um, tool that can make certain, certain tests. And if that one reacts, then I found life. A little more sophisticated, but basically it has this, the same problem. Uh, good for you, but no one else will accept that you have actually found life. Is there no other way of doing it? There are some even more radical way of doing it. Uh, they have started to pop up some ideas lately. I will only mention a couple here. Um, I will start with this one, life as a scale. Some have... have um, so that, well, maybe it's not like black and white. Maybe we can't say that uh, it's life or not life. Maybe it's just like, well, this one is kind of a life, kind of alive, and this thing is a little bit less alive. Uh, that could be a way of doing it. Um, could be worth trying. I see some issues with it. Uh, one is that it's pretty counterintuitive to many of us. I know maybe you can, can uh, protest later. Uh, another is that it doesn't really get rid of the problem of finding criteria for life. It just adds the problem of you, just, you don't just have to find criteria for life. You also have to weigh them and say that, okay, if... If you find this biosignature, if you find something with this property, then it's a bit alive. If you find something with this property, it's a little bit less alive. Uh, so I'm not sure it's, it makes things easier, but we can discuss that. Um, another way is the cluster definition. Uh, it goes back to Ludwig Wittgenstein. Um, the German British philosopher. Um, he asks himself, he, he was one of the more uh, famous critics of the day definition during the, the, the previous century. He asked himself, for instance, for instance, what is a game? And he realized that there is no real one property or set of properties that fits for everything we call a game. So is it still meaningful to? to use the term game? And he said, yes, it is. It makes sense um, to, to talk about some things as games and other things as not being games. How? Well, he introduced what he called fam family resemblance. I will not try to say it in, in German, but you can read it here. Um, in his book, Philosophical Investigations. Um, what does that mean? Well. How do people belong to the same family? It's not that you say that, well, if you belong to the Pearson family, then you have a particular property that all members of this family has. You cannot say that all members of the Pearson family had the same father. That would be a really weird family, right? Uh, but that's one property. 
uh, my kids, uh, you could say that they have the same father and the same mother, so they be belong to the same property, the person family. But um, the, that, that works for the kids, but not for the parents. But the parents have the same offspring, so that's another way you can belong to the same family, and so on, right? So you can belong to the same family in more than one way. Uh, and this is kind of the key to this, this type of, of, of definition. So you can make like clusters. You can say that um, the parents belong to the same family because they are married and have kids together. The kids belong to the same family because they are their siblings. Um, or you can have all kinds of different ways different people can belong to the same family. I just mentioned the, 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 the most typical ones, but there are, you, you, can, you can construct this in, in many different ways, but it's still meaningful to say that you belong to the same family, you don't belong to our family. Um, could this be used to, to define life? Well, there are attempts to, 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 to doing this. Uh, let's look again on, at the list of, of criteria that we were looking at before. All of these criteria are, as we saw, pretty closely associated with life. They don't work maybe as, as necessary criteria, but they are still pretty closely associated with life. And maybe you can say that you can be alive in more than one way. Right? Um, everything that, that can appropriate and is organic is alive, but uh, you can also be alive in some other way by having metabolism and, and temporarily withstanding entropy and so on. Um, and with uh, overlapping um, clusters like this, you can kind of cover the map of, of life. That's one way of doing it. Uh, it has some, some advantages. You don't have to assume that there is one essence of life. It's kind of flexible. Um, it builds on life as we know it, but it can be amended. Um, it, it, it's still kind of stable in that the structure is the same, but you can you can add uh, properties as as you find new life or as evolution continues, for instance. Uh, so that's one way of doing it. Um, so now. Um, I'm looking forward to a discussion. Thank you. Hello, Professor Pearson. Nice to see you again. So uh, how would you comment on, on Carol Cleland's position? If I can recall correctly, she claims that uh, the project of of, of trying to find a definition of life could be futile and, and we should strive to, to, to develop a general theory of life. So, and also that astrobiology could be, could be performed without a definition of life, that, that we should search for interesting anomalies, interesting possibly in the sense of some implicit assumptions about life and compare these extraterrestrial or possibly terrestrial anomalies with familiar life. So do you find uh, any significant difference between this position? Okay, so we should still strive to find a definition of life in, in, in the way you presented it. And with Carol Cleland's position, no, we should abandon that and try to develop uh, a general theory of life. So for, for me, it's a bit confusing, like, the, 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 the relationship between a, a theory and a definition, it seems to me that should be more intimate. So I would, I would like to hear your, your comment on that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that's a very good question. And um, I think, first of all, I don't really agree with, with Carol that um, uh, about this need of a theory of life preceding a definition. I think she, she compares with 
water as H2O, for instance, but life is not a substance. So I don't think that comparison really holds. Um, then I think that she has right in the sense that uh, we probably don't need to have a complete definition of life in order to start the project of astrobiology. We can, we, the definition of life will in some sense always be kind of temporary. There is always the, the, the possibility that it has to change. So in that sense, uh, yeah, um, it, it, it's, uh, we have to be open for it to, 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 to change. Um, but I, I think that she is a bit too pessimistic and, and I'm not sure that she's right that, that uh, it will be um, that we need to find a second case of life before we define life. Uh, and I'm not even sure that it would help completely uh, because if we find, if we have a definition of life, even a contemporary, even a, a temporary uh, definition of life, and then we find life on some other world, that life form will be defined, will be identified based on the, the life that we already know. So it's not necessarily the case that it will change a lot. Um, so I don't know if, if I have answered your, your, your question, but um, basically I, I agree that I don't, I'm not totally convinced by, by, by Carol's reason. Thanks. Th thank you. I have some further questions, but if, 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 if there is time, may, may, maybe later. Thank you. Uh, Erica also raised her hand, so the floor is yours. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, good morning. Thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, if I have uh, well understood, uh, you, you provided an example of a family just to say that uh, in the end, uh, um, you aim to list uh, um, some properties. Uh, which can be uh, related or identifying uh, life, and then apply a sort of clustering, uh, cluster analysis, to see when uh, such properties are overlapped. So uh, first of all, uh, please correct me if I have not properly understood. And second, uh, if I have understood, uh, my question is, uh, which is the minimum, uh, from the technical point of view, which is the minimum requirement uh, of a uh, cluster uh, of um, uh, parameter overlapping to have a good cluster, which can be defined as representative of life? Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Uh, you, seems to me you have understood it perfectly correct. Uh, about um, the question, I think that is still work in progress. So I, th I think there are groups working on that, but I'm not sure that there is a definite answer to your question yet. The groups are working on, on uh, cluster definitions are still working on like minimum criteria, for instance. Okay. So uh, we have to wait and see. But it's very interesting. Yes, thank you. Thank you. We also have some comments in the chat, if you would like to answer to them. Right. Um, we have something from uh, GM Claverie. The difficulty, sorry if I mispronounced the name. The difficulty of defining life is due to the fact that living organisms are not objects, but they exist through cycles. And so processes, is that, for instance, as virions or particles, virus do not look like alive, but doing their intercellular parasitic 
um, uh, phase, they have all the regular living behavior. Think of the seed plant cycle, is the seed alive? Right, um, yeah. The question of which level to define life on is, is also um, controversial. Uh, is uh, seed alive, is a cell alive, um, and so on. Uh, so there are many questions in, in connection with this. Uh, that living things is not an object, but a process. Yes, that's one of these um, ideas that has popped up uh, fairly recently. Uh, I didn't mention it, but but you're right. It's good, good that you mention it. Um, so can you say that life is actually a process? Yeah, that's, that's an interesting idea. Uh, I don't have, I mean, I, I can't say a definite yes or no, but only that. It's an interesting idea, and there are people working on that. Um, so, so um, um, yeah, let's let, let's see what comes out of that idea. If you have anything more, if you're an advocate of one of these or one of those who work on it, please. next uh, I see that we have John uh, raise his hand so go ahead thank you um, can you hear me okay yes yeah perfect okay I, I work at the German um, space center in Berlin in the exoplanets department in atmospheres and one of the things we're interested in is looking for possible biosignature signals in spectral absorption bands I um, thank you for a great talk. It's like really cool. I learned a lot. Um, my question is like one of the like, you know, we have this problem also. How do we like write a science paper and put in a definition of life? And one of the definitions which comes a lot up a lot in, in the literature that I read, at least, is the, the NASA 1984 workshop, um, which you, you're nodding your head. So for those who maybe don't know so much about it, um, uh, it's by Joyce, um, and it, it, the, the conclusion they came up with was, I haven't read you in detail, was like a, a self-sustaining chemical system capable of Darwinian evolution. And then people start arguing about, yeah, what, what's, what's self-sustaining, what's chemical, blah, blah, what's Darwinian evolution. Could you comment on that? Because it's, it's just replacing one, it's not really solving the problem, yeah? It's just like shifting the problem. <laughs> yeah, no, it's... it's uh... I guess a, a way of just deciding something that that's made kind of intuitive sense. But as you notice, uh, if, if you really dig into it, there are lots of problems with it. One thing is that uh, they talk about uh, chemical systems and many people um, think that why does it have to be chemical system. In in one sense, you can say that everything is a chemical system. Everything is made up by chemical uh, elements or compounds somehow. Uh, on the other hand, do you mean do they mean something more with that? Um, that that excludes something? And uh, then you say that why then exclude something based on its chemistry? It seems a bit Earth-centric, and it seems that it doesn't really capture uh, this thing. What's interesting with with life, and it doesn't um, seem to do the job we want to 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 focus totally on the on the, on the chemistry. Uh, another thing is that if you talk about the chemistry, then you're talking about organisms, like, like individuals. And as we mentioned before, some people think that life shouldn't be defined as, as individuals, but as processes. And also the definition in itself contains a phrase like capable of Darwinian evolution. And as we know, individuals don't evolve. Individuals can adapt, but hopefully, uh, but they don't evolve. It's the population that evolves. So it contains 
actually a, a contradiction. Uh, the, the chemistry part focuses on individuals, while the, but while the evolution part uh, focuses on, on uh, populations or, or uh, processes. So yeah, there's lots of problems with it. And, and it seems to me that um, it needs a lot of work. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, then we have Philip, who also raised his hand, so go ahead. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Perfect. Thanks for the great talk. It was really interesting. I was wondering, um, it ties to, to John's, what John said, with the, the, the need for defining life in, 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 in the practice of writing a paper. Um, I, I find that when I read uh, astrobiology research papers that very often um, what what people mean when they use the term life is something more particular or something more wide like um, chemical disequilibrium or something that they're actually looking for. So it seems that to me that very often um, it's in, in, in some sense, it, it seems entirely fine just to be on the lookout for a chemical disequilibrium and test whether, for example, the oxygen um, measured in the in the atmosphere of an exoplanet um, um, in the in the context of the planet is is enough to say, yeah, well, this is a disequilibrium, aka it is life. And in, in this, so I was wondering. Um, whether you think that like what is the usefulness of of the term life in in actual astrobiology um given that there seems to be a lot of practical ways around defining life um is it does it really just boil down to the question of when we encounter it how to decide whether this is life or not or um like can we just eliminate it um from from a lot of scientific practice what what if it's so troubling to define life, uh, what, what does it really add to have it? Thanks. Yeah, I, I think uh, I need to refer to uh, what the philosophers call the open question argument. Um, so first of all, I think that this thing life is what makes astrobiology interesting and meaningful. And you could say that screw that, I look for this particular thing and I don't care about whether it's life or not, but that also uh, takes away quite a lot of the value, I think, of what we're doing in astrobiology. Um, then you could say that, well, um, let's look at chemical death equilibrium or, or so something else and say that, um, um, we, we, we focus on this particular uh, biosignature, and that's great. Um, but still, I think the, everyone who does, who does that has some idea that this is actually somehow strongly connect, connected to actual life. Otherwise, it would probably not, not, not do that. And if you if you don't if 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 you don't consider the question of what life is, and you say that hey I found this, uh, then uh, there will still be the question yes, but but is it life? Uh, um, so so I think there is a need to 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 really find the the, the question of the uh, or the, the answer to the big existential questions. There is a um, ambition some, somewhere in astrobiology to actually do that, or at least to contribute to, to answering these questions. And sure, you can, you can uh, in a particular study, you can focus on this particular thing because it, it works, uh, but it doesn't mean that you don't have this more uh, ambitious like ambition in the end. Um, um, yeah, and, and biosignatures, the way we talk about biosignatures today and the way we use biosignatures today is often very strongly associated with life as we know it on Earth today, 
which makes good sense because it's a good place to start. We start with what we already know, but I don't think people inside or outside of astrobiology would in the long run be satisfied with just doing that. In the end, I think we have bigger ambitions. That would be my answer. Thanks. Are there any more questions? Alexander, please go ahead. Thank you. Um, uh, well, uh, do you think that uh, Gantis Camerton model should be more recognized in astrobiology? Because according to Gantis himself, uh, this model has at least two advantages. It, presents a sharp boundary between life and non-life, and it can incorporate alternative chemistry or, or extraterrestrial chemistry, as he himself says. So I, I, I don't know how much is this model discussed in, in current astrobiology, and if it is not, do you think it should be more, more, more discussed? Thanks. Okay, thank you. Well, I'm not a chemist, so I, I cannot judge the, 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 the chemical advantages and, uh, and disadvantages. I am a little bit worried about, uh, oh, the light went off here, <laughs> sorry. I'm a little bit skeptic to this, to putting too much focus on the chemistry. I understand the uh, temptation of doing it, and I understand that it has some instrumental advantages when looking for biosignatures. Um, but I think I have to distinguish between the question of also definition of life on one hand and what is a uh, um, strong biosignature on the other. Uh, the, I mean, what is a bio biosignature has to depend on how we define life, but definition of life, I think, cannot just be about... Um, the chemical basis for life. Uh, it seems to me a little bit arbitrary. As you say, um, in this, this um, suggestion, there is, there is an opening for alternative chemistry, which is um, um, interesting and, and maybe useful, but I don't think it's um, answers like the question of defining life, but it may be useful. But I don't know enough chemistry to, to say if that's the case. Sorry. Okay. Um, maybe we can proceed with Irma's question. Um, hi, uh, thank you so much for the talk, uh, Eric. So um, I, I would like to back. Uh, I would like to go back to your methodology, while your proposal about the clustering and the resemblance. So um, I was wondering because at the end, a clustering is based on whatever the variables or or the features you are including in the to make the clustering, right? So then, do you have any? Um, have you give a talk uh, a thought about which could be? I mean, if you are just including in this um, clustering uh, properties that are are only specific for individuals or for populations or both of them, or if they are um, describing processes or or specific objects. And I am just saying this because at the end, probably, I don't know if that is part also of these clusterings of, of this me methodology, is that not only go for the big goal of what is life, but that is also the clustering being able or will could be able to kind of make a natural classification of subfamilies that will point then to different kind of ways to uh, be part of the 
process of life or this big family of life. So because one thing will be some set of properties could be, uh, be directed about what we are what we are talking when we are uh, which processes will be directed for what we are talking about uh, biological entities that could include like viruses and uh, cell based organisms when we are talking about what is being alive that is just if this is just a particular period of the of the growth and or just includes reproduction and not the seeds and not the other you know like uh, phases of, of the of the life cycle for for any uh, biological entity and also other features of this big clustering other sub uh, uh, clustering of this big family could point to these particular things that could help us just for uh, the biosignatures that we could we could call the evidence for life so I don't know if I am making myself clear so it's just which have you give a thought about how you will produce all these features uh, just to either going directly to the big question and what is this thing that we call life? Or if that will, could you also consider that these clusterings, this resembles family will also include subfamilies that could direct to more, to, a dif to different ways. To, to, to call life, right? To, to be part of this process of life. Yeah, thank you for your answer. answer. Thank you, very good. Um, first, um, there are different approaches, but I think in general, um, one tries to be very agnostic when it comes to which properties to include in the first phase. And then maybe the cluster methodology will sort out certain properties that can be used for clustering and others other properties that cannot be used so i think the it starts by being quite agnostic um also when it comes to uh, as you say whether we talk about individuals or cells or populations and and, and, and so on and then hopefully it, it will it will um, um weed out some and and keep some. Uh, when it comes to using this methodology for, for creating like families of life, I think not. And I think the reason is that one wants to use this as a, a cluster definition of life. So just like with the family, um, you you want to say that all the members in a family are members of a family to to, to an equal extent right uh, the parents and the kids and 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 and, and the, so on are all uh, members of the family family to an equal extent so the those who wants to use clustering as a definition of life probably do not want to make these kinds of, of uh, distinction between different clusters. But I know cluster, clustering has also been used for defining species. That's it's a different way of using clustering, but it has been used in that sense too. So in, that, in those cases, yes, but when it comes to defining life, probably not. That's a good, good point. Thank you. A good question. 